In the dark of night on December 8, 1870, a Danish warship stealthily approached the western banks of the Wusong River. The Danes had a secret mission to plant telegraphic poles and lines across the Shanghai countryside. As they were doing this without the permission of the Qing government, they had to be careful not to be spotted. They were successful. By the 1870s, telegraphy was commonplace. Less than 30 years after Samuel Morris sent his first telegram in the US, the world was now interconnected through underwater electromagnetic cables. However, after being ravaged by the Western powers during the Opium Wars in the early 1800s, China wanted nothing to do with this Western invention. In fact, the Qing government in charge actively rebuffed offers of telegraphic lines from both France and Russia in the 1860s. However, the Danes decided to take the aggressive route. With the cooperation of Britain, they connected the existing Hong Kong line up to Shanghai, effectively connecting China with Europe. But before we get into how China would reclaim its sovereignty in the era of telegraphy, we have to first figure out how to turn 50,000 Chinese characters into dits and thus. And spoiler alert, unlike the Chinese typewriter, it was foreigners, not the Chinese, that were in charge. The person at the helm of the secret mission was a Danish financier named Carl Frederick Tietgen. Tietgen had played a major role in the industrialization of Denmark, and now as the head of the Great Northern Telegraph Company, based in Denmark, he was looking to tap into the Chinese market. However, he did not go to Shanghai empty-handed. In the months leading up to the secret mission, Tietgen had recruited someone in Denmark to drop up a Chinese telegraphic code. The funny thing is, Denmark was a small country and Tietgen didn't know any Chinese experts up for the job. His best bet was an astronomy professor named Hans Schellerup, who had studied Chinese as part of his research on lunar eclipses in different regions. Although Schellerup was no Chinese expert, he knew a thing or two about Chinese, especially the fact that it was not phonetic and that it was usually organized by radicals. The Kangxi Dictionary, the standard for organizing characters at that time, had about 50,000 characters. But it was common knowledge that 10,000 characters would be fine in most use cases. And thus, Shellarup's thinking probably went something like this. Chinese needs 10,000 Morse codes. 10 to the fourth power is 10,000. And there are 10 number codes. So we use four digit number codes to express Chinese characters. Step five, profit. <coughs> and he was off. He created a draft of 260 characters on two pages and he handed it over to Tietjen and he actually never stepped foot in China himself. And thus the Great Northern had to find someone on the ground in Shanghai to complete the job. It's hard to believe that only 150 years ago, the telegram was the high-tech invention considered the internet of its time. Did you know that the first transatlantic telegram took a whopping 16 hours to send? It can be easy to take for granted what we have these days, especially when it comes to language learning. As many of you guys are language learners, I'm always trying to find useful and innovative products to introduce to you. And this time I present to you, Link. As you know, I've been studying Korean for 14 years now, and although I'm fluent, there's still a lot of vocab that I don't know. Link has been a total game changer. Link is the perfect training app for me or anyone else who wants to take their language learning to the next level. As I'm a visual learner, I usually try to improve my Korean by watching Korean YouTube videos. Although YouTube provides a transcript, the problem is I have to click out of the video to look up any unknown words. With Link, I can click on any word or phrase and immediately see its meaning. This turns the word into new and it's added to my Link vocabulary list. The next time the word appears in a video, the word is highlighted and I'm once again reminded of its meaning. Eventually, after using the app for a while, the new words turn into known words or links, and this helps me decide what material to watch next. If that sounds like something up your alley, I've got a reference link for Link in the description. For those of you serious about language learning, I really think you should give Link a try. And now, back to the video. And the Danes could find themselves no better candidate than a Frenchman named Septime Auguste Villiers. Remember I said in the intro that the French tried to coax Qing Dynasty into connecting a line with them? 
Well, they brought Vigier over to Shanghai for that project. And once that project didn't pan out, Vigier just decided to hang out in Shanghai. Vigier, now working as a customs agent in Shanghai, was familiar with word copying machines and had a working knowledge of Chinese. He took the two-page manual by Shellerup and fleshed out a manual of 6,899 characters with about 3,000 spaces left empty for new words to be added based on future necessity. He called the manual 电报新书, or the New Telegraph Codebook. With the Chinese telegraph codes completed, China was now a thriving member of the telegraphic community, right? Wrong. So wrong. So blissfully naive for one to think such a thing. First of all, each Morse code for a Chinese character, a four-digit number, had absolutely no connection to the character it represented. It wasn't connected by sound. It wasn't connected by meaning, not by frequency, not by complexity, nothing. A native Chinese speaker had to basically grapple with the Morse code for Chinese as if they were learning a foreign language. In one way, this was a very neutral decision by the foreigners. At that time, there was no official dialect in China, and the sound each character makes varies from region to region, and so by cutting out phonetics completely from Morse code, Vigie could not be accused of playing favorites. However, making each Chinese character a four-digit number had another major problem. Even the shortest number code was longer than the longest letter code. And because telegrams were charged by the length, that means that Chinese telegrams were inherently more expensive to send than languages that use Latin letters. Let's just look at a simple example. The Morse code for the word desk is as follows. Now, what's desk in Chinese? It's shu zhuo. And what is that in Morse? Now I mentioned that the cost of telegrams was calculated based on the length, the shorter, the cheaper. And as we all know, English grammar has a lot of lengthening words, such as conjunctions, affixes, word, verb agreements, making entire sentences quite long. Thus, it became common for English senders to use uncommon words to represent other, usually much longer concepts, and thus saving money. In fact, entire guides were created on how to skirt the rules. For example, according to a 1905 theatrical cipher code, a telegraphic guide for those in the theater business, filament means, are they willing to appear in tights? Philander means, are you willing to appear in tights? And filibuster means, chorus girls who are shapely, good looking, and can sing. As a former theater kid, what can I say? We're just built different. Chinese being sent with abstract strings of numbers in the first place had no way to circumvent these already exorbitant costs. Not only that, but because the telegraph lines in China were mostly built by foreigners, that means that for every telegram sent on Chinese soil, China would have to pay the foreign operator an additional fee. So it's sounding like China is pretty passive in all this, just the receiving end of bad hand after bad hand. Well, that's because China hadn't been attending any of the International Telegraphic Conferences first inaugurated in 1865. It was at these conferences where laws regarding telegram fees were discussed and finalized. Like I mentioned, the Qing government wanted nothing to do with Europe, especially after Denmark and Great Britain went against its back and illegally installed telegraph lines in the country. 60 years after the first conference, the newly established Republic of China was finally sending its first ever delegate to Paris in 1925. Their delegate, Wang Jingchun, had big shoes to fill. His goal? To convince his fellow delegates that the fact that the Chinese language was not counted as language, but as numbers, was a big injustice that everyone should care about. The only catch? Nobody other than China was using a non-alphabetic script. Would he be able to make his voice heard? <laughs> By the early 1900s, telegraphy had become a booming business. People from all walks of life, different backgrounds, different industries, were using telegrams to communicate. 
As the cost of a telegram was based on length, the sender and the receiver could work out a system through which they could communicate long, detailed messages using one single word. For example, Revere, according to one stock mining brokerage firm, meant the following 31-word message. Wires being down, your telegram did not reach us in time to transact any business today. And as your orders are good for the week, we will try to execute tomorrow. People were also using things like acronyms, punctuation marks, numbers, random combinations of letters to try to skirt the rules. Telegram companies, eager to clamp down on what they considered unauthorized use of language in telegrams, introduced a new technical class of service in 1912. In order to service a wider range of customers, deferred telegrams were introduced around the world. If a telegram did not need to be sent in a timely manner, the sender could opt for it to be sent at a delayed time, up to 48 hours later, at a reduced rate of half price. However, there was a catch. All the previous attempts at skirting telegram costs, like sending acronyms, punctuation marks, random combinations of letters and numbers, were not available for this deferred service. That means that not only was Chinese already two to four times more expensive to send than other languages, it could not use this half-price deferred system at all. It was with this massive burden on his shoulders that Wang Jingchun showed up to Paris in 1925. Wang Jingchun, better known by his Romanized name, Qing Chun Wang. I'm sorry, I don't know how Americans would pronounce his name. Please let me know how you pronounce his name in the comments. Um, he was born into a Christian family in Hebei, China, and he was a contemporary of Zhou Ho Quin, who was the first Chinese person to create a Chinese typewriter. Shout out back to my Chinese typewriter video. So Wang Jingchun was very smart. He studied at Yale and then the University of Illinois, where he got his PhD in economics and politics. Every Asian parent's dream, right? <laughs> With a strong background in both Chinese and Western culture, he became the de facto ambassador for China in the West. This time in Paris, it was his mission, his duty, to make clear that China was not trying to skirt the rules in any attempt to pay less than its fair share. According to Wang, China just wanted to be seen as an equal in the telegraphy community. But unfortunately, that task would not be an easy one. As I mentioned before, all the other delegates at the conference represented alphabetic languages. Very early in the game, all the good codes, aka the short codes, were taken up by English because the creator of Morse code was, of course, an American. Other languages that used the Latin alphabet but had diacritics, like French, Spanish, and German, had to fight to make sure that their letters could be as cost-effective as non-diacritic letters. Alas, the issue of plain text, aka text meaning exactly what it says, and secret text, remember revere, was a hot topic that many delegates were eager to hash out. This became a centerpiece of the Paris conference, and many sessions broke out dedicated to this topic. None of this was of any interest to Wang Jingchun, however. Chinese wasn't using alphabet letters, so the difference between letters with or without diacritics, or secret text versus plain text, these were not issues that Wang needed to have an opinion on. However, Wang was a consummate professional, a diplomat with quiet charm and resolve, and he attended these sessions as a show of goodwill to his European counterparts. Eventually, the European delegates started to pay attention. In the after-hour sessions of the conference, Wang and his delegation would demonstrate the unique characteristics of the Chinese script. Wang would carefully explain that because the Chinese script is logographic in nature, there were too many homophones, making an alphabetic representation of Chinese for Morse unfeasible. And thus, the Chinese had no choice but to use four-digit numbers as telegraphic representations. Eventually, after almost two months, at the conclusion of the 7th International Telegraphic Conference, Wang's wish was finally granted. Chinese four-digit numbers would now be considered plain text when it came to pricing or taxation rules. This was a huge victory for China's sovereignty in the early 20th century. Chinese script was now considered text, just like every other language that used the telegraph. <laughs> 
The original 1872 manual created by Frenchman Viguier, despite it being not very user-friendly and not really good for cryptography, was widely used in China until the 1980s, albeit with updates over the years. Eventually, it became possible to use pre-designated three-digit Latin letters to send characters, but four-digit numbers were the norm. In the 60s and 70s, telegrams were the standard method for Chinese to send messages to loved ones in faraway places. Messages like the following were commonplace. Jia wei su hui, there is a problem at home, come back immediately. And, qin ai de ba ba, ni shen me shou neng hui jia, wo he ya ya xiang ni le. Dear daddy, when are you coming home? Ya ya and I miss you. And the 80s were truly the heyday for commercial telegraphy in China. In 1990, Beijing hit a record 44 million telegrams sent that year. However, with the closure of the Hangzhou branch of the Chinese Telegram in early 2025, Beijing is now the only city in China with an operational telegram service. Just before the Hangzhou branch closed earlier this year, hundreds of people nostalgic for the now antiquated technology lined up at the station, eager to send just one last message. As we know, the telegram was later replaced by the pager, and then the telephone, and most consequentially, the computer. But that's a video for another day. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. Bye now. Okay, so I know some of you are wondering if Morse code was created today, wouldn't we just use pinyin? And after some careful consideration, I think we still wouldn't be using pinyin for Morse. Why? Morse code is essentially a binary on-off switch. Even if you use pinyin and tone markers like YI4 for this character E, it could also be a host of other words, E, E. E, E. There are tons of characters that have this exact pinyin and tone marker. Unlike with the computer where we can, you know, type in the sound and stroke information and then select a character from those choices, Morse code is a one-to-one -one correspondence between input and output. We need to have a unique code for each character. That's my conclusion. Bye now.